The following video contains references to sexual violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Okay, everybody, please keep your electrodes on. Oh my God. Take a deep breath. What's it's up? okay. It's oh okay. Cyrus. Oh my God. This is Cyrus, what's normal. happening? Oh. Cyrus. Cyrus. Please keep the Cyrus. wires on. Oh. Sometimes the headline is the goal. At least that was the strategy for Netflix when they ponied up a whopping $17 million for Greg Jardin's feature debut. A sort of bodies, bodies, bodies meets talk to me meets Freaky Friday, if I were to put it into Hollywood terms. It worked though because entertainment writers fell all over themselves to write about the price tag, which just wound up being publicity for the film. With the film dropping during spooky season, we see that it lives up to the hype as a fun mind-bending thriller whose major sins are being limited in exploring its concept by genre conventions and Greg Jordan's cowboy bebop directorial tendencies. Thankfully, the screenplay mixes substance with the style, enough to justify multiple rewatches to appreciate the social, psychological, and moral implications of body swapping. Since that's my jam, here we are. We're gonna swap some spoilers, so be warned. This is really one of those films where you need to go in cold. Remember to please like the video and to subscribe to the channel. The film begins with Shelby and Cyrus, a young couple who should not, and I cannot stress this enough, be a couple. Shelby, played by the White Lotus's Brittany O'Grady, dons a blonde wig, hoping to roleplay for Cyrus, who is more concerned with masturbating to porn and to their mutual friend Nikki's Instagram. The couple argue all the way to their friend Ruben's wedding, where they reunite with Nikki and Ruben, as well as fuckboy Dennis, hippie Maya, and horny Brooke. The group hasn't been together like this since an incident in college in which their friend Forbes got into a fight with Dennis, who was hooking up with Forbes's underage sister Beatrice. The fight led to Forbes getting kicked out of school and joining the tech industry, while Beatrice was institutionalized due to drugs and trauma. To everyone's surprise, Forbes shows up to the party with a briefcase and a party game, a device that can swap people's bodies. Forbes suggests they use it to play a sort of advanced version of Werewolf. Shelby is apprehensive and immediately gets found out as a result. The group wrongly accuses Cyrus of leaping into Dennis's body when in fact it's Forbes in Dennis's body and Cyrus in Ruben's. Forbes plays along for the sake of the game, which becomes important when Maya, in Nikki's body, kisses Cyrus who she assumes to be Forbes in Ruben's body. <sighs> it turns out that Ruben and Maya have a thing for one another that they've been suppressing because Ruben is getting married. So this is an opportunity for Maya to hook up with Ruben without actually hooking up with Ruben. Since it's actually Cyrus in Ruben's body, it's a chance for Cyrus to hook up with Nikki without Shelby knowing. Eventually, the group returns and gets restored to their original bodies. Shelby, who is suffering from some self-esteem issues thanks to Cyrus's constant rejection, actually wound up loving being in another body and can't wait to do it again. Cyrus is hesitant though, having been a little freaked out by Forbes lying about who was in whose body and also being upset that Shelby is talking to other men. If you haven't figured it out yet, Cyrus is the worst. When the gang goes for round two, that's when things really get interesting. Okay. Shelby winds up in Nikki's body, Nikki in Brooke's body, Brooke in Maya's body, Maya in Shelby's body, Cyrus winds up in Forbes' body, Forbes in Ruben's body, Ruben in Dennis's body, and Dennis in Cyrus's body. <sighs> Shelby becomes intoxicated with the idea of being Nikki. She posts an Instagram photo and is overwhelmed by the deluge of horny reply guys. It's gross, but it's also exactly the kind of validation that Shelby needed. Cyrus is already freaked out and done, though. He immediately starts flashing the signal he and Shelby came up with to let each other know who is who. Shelby is so excited to be Nikki, though, that she doesn't respond right away, and he has to figure it out for himself later on when she freaks out about a spider. Cyrus drags her to the greenhouse where they argue over the game and also over their relationship. Shelby wants to have sex with Nikki's body, probably subconsciously sensing how attracted Cyrus is to her. But Cyrus is skeeved out by the whole thing. Not so much because he doesn't want to have sex with Nikki, but because he doesn't want Shelby to have sex with Forbes. Meanwhile, Reuben, in Dennis's body, remember, asks Brooke, who is in Maya's body, to check out the roof. They start to have sex on the balcony, with Reuben promising to leave his fiance for either Brooke or Maya. It just really doesn't seem to matter to him. He just wants to be uninhibited. Enjoying it, aren't you? I mean, he, uh, he does what he wants. 
Unfortunately, the balcony is old and rickety and can't withstand the raw animal lust, sending Reuben and Dennis's body and Brooke and Maya's body to their deaths. Everyone rightly freaks out, especially Dennis and Maya, who have no bodies to return to now. What follows is the social bonds among the group evaporating and accusations, revelations, and acrimony. Dennis goes ballistic at the thought of having to live as Reuben. He thinks that it's unfair that Cyrus gets to reclaim his body and kick Dennis out. During their fight, Dennis reveals that Cyrus didn't even want Shelby. He only pursued her after ruining Dennis's relationship with Nikki so that he could ask her out, and then he never even did. Shelby realizes that Cyrus always wanted Nikki instead of her, and now she doesn't want to give up Nikki's body at all. Which is a real problem for Nikki, who is stuck in Brooke's body. Dennis really ups the ante by calling the police and confessing to killing Dennis and Maya while in Cyrus's body. That leaves everyone scheming against one another, and Cyrus desperately trying to convince Shelby that he wants her and only her, so that she will be his alibi once they switch back. That's undermined when he slips up in front of Maya, who he tried to make out with in round one while she was in Nikki's body. Forbes agrees to put everyone back right as the police bust down the door. And the irony of it all, massive spoiler incoming, Forbes never actually showed up to the party. It was always his sister Beatrice, sprung from the institution, who stole his body and showed up to wreak havoc. It turns out that body swapping can become quite addictive. Like each new body you're going into is giving you another piece yes. of the human condition. Exactly. Until after yes. a while, you just want it to constantly switch. Yeah. And at the end of it all, only Cyrus and Shelby wind up in their original bodies, with Cyrus stuck in prison for murder, and Shelby deciding once and for all that she just doesn't need him. Now would be a good time to start thinking of a comment. Okay, first of all, this is an excellent film and you should see it. I think it has the potential to be a great cult classic in a party movie because it invites multiple viewings just to keep everything straight. Wait a minute! Who are you? The performances are excellent, although the characters aren't quite differentiated enough to be impressed by a transformation when one actor takes over for another. It's not that the actors don't do a good job with the swaps, it's just that we only get about 10 minutes with the eight characters before the swapping begins. Great Jardin's direction is highly stylized, as it was in Cowboy Bebop. But here it seems to fit a little better thanks to the film's substance. In Bebop, it was more like it was aping someone else's style. Here it does seem like its own stylistic direction, although I'm pretty sure we didn't need to see a hypercut of close-ups when Cyrus shifts his car into park. Now the thing that really interests me is the social and philosophical ramifications of body switching. And fortunately, the film embodies several thought experiments and concepts in fictional storylines. Even this game is important. Like, playing this, becoming a different ethnicity, could change people's worldviews. Like, it's okay, big stuff. Nikki, the major theme this film deals with, in the case of Shelby, and to a lesser extent Reuben, is the idea of self-concept. Self-concept is how our beliefs, feelings, and thoughts shape our identity and our behavior. Near the end of the film, Cyrus tells Shelby that he chose porn and fantasy over her because he's f***ed up. It's one of the few honest moments from him in the film, but it comes too little too late. Shelby has already internalized a lack of attractiveness due to his rejection of her. It's why she's so eager to play the game, and why she doesn't want to give up being Nikki. Reuben, on the other hand, while one of the duller characters in the film, does get one discernible trait. He wants to rail Maya silly. But of course he's getting married and he fancies himself a good guy, so it would be wrong. When he jumps into Dennis's body, who is nothing but id, morality goes out the door. So allow me to speedrun these ideas. Carl Rogers came up with the idea of the ideal self, the person we wish we were, and its impact on our self-esteem. The farther our ideal self is from who we perceive ourselves to be, the lower our self-esteem. Edward Torrey Higgins expanded on that idea with self-discrepancy theory in the late 1980s, adding that there can be a clash between a person's inner identity, who they want to be, and who they think they should be. Near the end of the film, Shelby offers to be Nikki for the rest of her life because Cyrus wants Nikki, essentially offering to kill off her inner identity in favor of her odd self. This is a fairly common way that people deal with the stress and inner turmoil that the discrepancy can cause although very few of us get the opportunity to actually be other people. Unless we adopt online personas that are different from our IRL personas. 
If you've ever created a fantasy version of yourself for a social media site or a video game, you get where Rogers and Higgins are coming from. Hazel Marcus, on the other hand, thought of our identities in terms of possible selves. Each idea of who we could be eventually gets killed off by the decisions we make. For every path we take, dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands, of other paths die off. It's basically the multiverse theory of identity. Beatrice mentions that swapping gives you another piece of the human condition, and both Brooke and Nikki agree that you get to see the untapped human potential. Oh, seriously, like when you see yourself, like literally see yourself from the outside, you it, it's like potential. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you had to know that we were going to talk about this one. There's a great story arc in Buffy the Vampire Slayer where Faith, the psychotic loner and rogue slayer, swaps bodies with Buffy due to some magical chicanery. At first, Faith is content to screw around with Buffy's friends, ruin her relationships, and generally act like a child. It's not until Faith sleeps with Buffy's boyfriend Riley, a homegrown Iowa boy who loves his mama, apple pie, country music, and monogamous, missionary-style sex, that Faith feels weird about the whole thing. Riley tells her that he loves her, thinking that it's Buffy, obviously. A declaration that Faith is not used to hearing after the man has already gotten what he wants. Who are you? What do you want from her? Over the course of the episode, with people treating Buffy with love and respect, Faith begins to feel loved and respected, something that causes her to fracture by the end of the episode. Buffy, meanwhile, is horribly mistreated by the Watcher's Council and mistrusted by everyone she runs across. She develops something of an understanding for why Faith turned out the way that she did. Sympathy, if not empathy. That is the usual lesson of the Freaky Friday trope. And in the, aw, uh, everyone learned a lesson about mutual respect in the end, circle jerk of it all, a lot of people don't stop to think, hey, did Faith just rape Buffy and Riley simultaneously? Do you have any idea what she did to me? It's What's Inside doesn't deal with that question directly, at least not where sex is concerned. In fact, it sort of treats the lack of consent as a feature, not a bug. Don't get me wrong, the film isn't pro-rape, it's more like the characters view transgression as a turn-on. This game is kind of hot. You know, because they're also awful. She'll be wanting to have sex with Cyrus while she's in Nikki's body as proof of this. She compares it to wearing a wig for role-playing. I mean like I'm wearing a wig. And remember, at this point, the thought of not even swapping back at all is starting to bubble up in her mind. So, this does kind of bring in a ship of Theseus factor that confounds the moral argument. After Reuben and Dennis's body and Brooke and Maya's body die, Dennis and Maya are going to be stuck in someone else's body. It's clear that trying to swap them back in wouldn't be successful and would probably result in their deaths. So obviously the moral thing to do isn't to kill them because of the decisions Reuben and Brooke made while inside their bodies. That means the moral character is in the mind. That's what's important. The body is just a meat sack run by electricity generated from tacos and pumpkin spice lattes. In other words, it's what's inside that counts. And if Dennis is going to have to swap into Ruben's body and Maya is going to have to swap into Brooks, do we have an expectation that they will never be able to make decisions with those bodies? To have sex? To skip leg day? To enter into one of those contests where the steak is free if you finish it in an hour? Of course not. Those are just their new bodies now. They can do with them as they wish. But we don't think of Nikki as having agency, either when Maya uses her to make out with Cyrus and Ruben's body, or when Shelby uses her to come onto Cyrus later. So it sounds like maybe the dividing line is if you're occupying the body permanently or temporarily. Dennis and Maya will just have new bodies because someone trashed their old ones. But Shelby would be stealing Nikki's. That certainly seems to be the exciting factor for Ruben and Brooke hooking up. He just wants to have sex with Maya's body. He doesn't care that it's not her. And Brooke doesn't care that he doesn't care. That's the excitement. The depravity is the kink. And that's something the film does its best to touch on before it has to wrap things up, lest it overstay its welcome. I will always appreciate a film that hangs smart ideas on its thriller premise, even when it doesn't foreground those ideas. In fact, especially when it doesn't foreground those ideas at the expense of the narrative. And as long as this doesn't get lost on the shuffle, it's what's inside deserves to become a cult classic. Stay hydrated, stay safe, wash your hands, return your shopping carts, make good choices, and I'll see you next time.